So today we live in something that I call the aluminium age. So when I went to school, we learned about the Iron Age, the Copper Age, the Bronze Age. Well, the last 100 years or so has been the aluminium age. And of course, quite rightly so, because when we discovered how to get aluminium out of its ores and use it, we found the most versatile, the most wonderful metal which we can use in so many different positive ways. The interesting thing about aluminium is that very shortly after it was first used in those ways, in the early part of the last century, there was a great deal of speculation about its toxicity, much coming from here, from France, much speculation about aluminium and cancer, Lots of things were published in the early part of the last century, and then we had a period of about 50 years or so when this seemed to go away, or at least the problem went away. And the problem perhaps reappeared most notably with the uh, investigations of human neurodegenerative diseases, and particularly Alzheimer's disease where it became clear that the main pathologies of these diseases, that aluminium was associated with those pathologies in the brain. And those associations, which were found in the 60s and early 70s, are those associations which we still see today. We haven't proven that aluminium causes, or even indeed has a role in Alzheimer's disease. But there's a great deal more evidence to suggest that that is the case today. See, much more relevant, I think, to this meeting is what's different about, for example, the way that we use aluminium in a vaccine as an adjunct. What is different is that most of the time, in our everyday exposure to aluminium, an exposure which means that every cell in our body has a small amount, one or two atoms of aluminium there, is that for most of us, what happens is we have this essentially slow but consistent exposure over years and decades. And indeed, we will all have more aluminium in our body when we die than when we were born. The difference is that when it's used as an adjuvant in vaccines is that we actually add a very large total amount of aluminium to the body in one go. It may seem like a small amount, it's, it's less than a milligram. But less than a milligram in a very tiny volume of, for example, muscle interstitial fluid. And then the question is, how does that milligram of aluminium react with the biological environment? And that's something we are researching right now, actually. And it's actually something we know very little about, despite having used aluminium adjuvants for nearly 100 years. So understanding the biology of that is one of the areas that we are concentrating on at the moment. Now, one thing that seems clear to myself, who began, I began my work looking why aluminium killed fish in acid waters, moved on from that. We specialize in understanding what we call the biological availability of aluminium, how it reacts in the biological environment. And you can imagine the first thing that potentially happens when you put an aluminium adjuvant as a vaccine into the body, is that that material can react actually in a number of different ways. It, some of it immediately dissolves to release the free metal cation, a small proportion initially. And that in itself will have immediate reactions at the site of injection. 
And when we all have our vaccinations, we all produce some sort of response, even if it's a tiny little red mark. And most of that is due to an initial toxic response, the toxicity of our immune. It's a controlled toxicity when it's used in the form of an antibiotic, or at least that's how we understand it to be. A controlled toxicity which then, in the men, initiates, we believe at least, one of two major types of immune response. So our main understanding is that we produce a response which goes through the uh, antibody uh, root immune response known as the TH2 response and we believe it is less responsible in promoting a TH1 response. However, when you go backwards again, remember that actually it's a very large dose of aluminium that you are hitting that initial site with. And it's coming likely and probable to us that the reason we potentially see one response as opposed to another response is because initially the TH2 response is overwhelming. It's the toxic response, the main toxicity. However, that aluminium doesn't just immediately all dissolve and disappear off the body. It isn't taken up by cells and taken away. Some of it persists. And actually what you get, potentially at least, is a dose response over time. Meaning that the aluminium remains at the site of injection for longer periods of time is still biologically reactive. But potentially it's going down a different route. And we're beginning to believe that this is how one might, in fact, actually engineer aluminium management to produce different types of responses by not using the overwhelming response that we use at the moment. We use that because it's so effective. We can use the tiniest amount of an antigen, as long as we have loads of aluminium, which will produce a big response and a big antibody response. And that's what we want, isn't it? Well, it may well be what you want to save money on the antigen, but is it what you want in terms of the biological response? The other aspect of this, which Professor Gerardi is pioneering now, is to understand what happens to the particulate aluminium, not the aluminium that is dissolved, but the aluminium that is disaggregated, perhaps, into smaller and smaller particles, some micron size, some potentially narrow particles, which can then be taken up by all manner of different types of infiltrating cells. And what we almost certainly know is that, again, different types of cells will take up different subsets of that aluminium depending upon the particle size. So the larger particle sizes will be taken up actively by endocytosis by certain types of cells actually going along and eating it, perhaps taking up the lymph nodes initiating uh, immune response. But other types of cells, aluminium will enter them because the aluminium is much smaller by other mechanisms potentially again producing other types of response. That particular aluminium will be redistributed from the site of injection by the different types of cell types. The possibility, and it seems a more real possibility today than it perhaps did two or three years ago, that some of the aluminium at the site of injection may then also go into the brain. Now that is a very real possibility from the type of animal work that people like Professor Gerard have undertaken, and indeed from other work using nanoparticles of other types, including aluminum, aluminium-based nanoparticles. There's lots of evidence.